Thank you, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Just before we get this kicked off, I just want to thank all of you in the live audience for making it out early on a Saturday morning after a long day yesterday. And then for everyone watching around the world, thanks for tuning in. And anyways, uh, as you can see on the first slide here, my name is Seth Thompson, and I'm the environment set supervisor on our pre-rendered team for what's now called Blizzard Animation, which is formerly called Blizzard Cinematics, where we make all the cinematic movies that you guys hopefully are familiar with. And uh, by the title that you see here, Displacing the Past and Sculpting the Future, I've been doing this a while. Uh, I've been working in uh, cinematics at Blizzard for over 15 years and um, working professionally for around 18 years. So it wasn't until around maybe 2004 or 5 that a lot of the digital sculpting that you're able to do with ZBrush now was really mainstream and taken into account for us. So before that, we had to do a lot of stuff by hand. And um, anyone here familiar with all the Reign of Chaos cinematics for Warcraft 3? Anyone? Oh. Anyone? <laughs> cool. So that's what some of this is from. So the first portion of the uh, demo that I'm going to be showing you guys is how we used to do displacement before the current modern methods of displacement existed where you're sculpting everything. And you can see down here, like, this black and white map. This is an example of what we had to do displacement with in the past. And by the way, this is not an image I made. This was actually one that my mentor, Patrick Thomas, uh, helped me, or he created for the show. But we'll come back to this slide later. I just want to show you a little bit of what you can expect to see. And um, leading up to the presentation, I was trying to take some of these old school techniques, combine them with some of the new school techniques of actually sculpting by hand and practicing some stuff. So. First part, I'll be talking to you a little bit about the history, how we used to do things before ZBrush was really mainstream. And then next, I'm going to give you guys a live demo and try and show you how to make this snow well in about 30 minutes if I pull it off correctly. Uh, the other thing, during the presentation, I've got to go pretty quick, so it's going to be hard for me to take questions during this. But uh, I will be around here for those in the live audience. Uh, you can ask me stuff after, and then you can hit me up on Facebook later, too. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself as this is going in the background. This is just some examples of ZBrush art that I created my personal time over the past few years. Uh, we're getting some feedback issues. Are you guys hearing that? Are you good? OK, cool. So um, like I said, I've been in the industry for quite a few years. The only two places I've worked professionally is at Blizzard Entertainment on the cinematic team. And when I started there back in the year 2000, there was only like 14 of us. And we had to do a little bit of everything. And um, now we're a department of maybe around 200 people. So it's grown a lot. And um, the only two places I've ever worked was on the cinematic team at Blizzard and then at uh, Square Enix in Tokyo, Japan, where I worked on Final Fantasy Advent Children and Final Fantasy XII. There's a little bit of lag on this. I apologize for that. But you get the idea. <laughs> so one thing I love about ZBrush is these days I supervise. And a lot of companies, if you're a supervisor, that means you don't do a ton of art on the job. So for me, when I get home, I want to be able to quickly do art and just have something that's super fun. And ZBrush allows me to do that. I can just jump right in and be an artist. I don't have to worry about uh, topology, things like that. Just go, and it's super awesome to use. And um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's just really interesting to see how uh, stuff has developed over the years from the time I had to do displacement without programs like this and then how you guys can just jump in and within a few hours get something like this that back in the day would take us a couple days. So anyways, I'm just going to jump ahead and uh, I'll show you a couple examples of some professional art that I did when I wasn't supervising, when I was doing more art back in the day. And this is the very first thing I ever created in ZBrush, uh, personally or professionally, and this is a skull that was seen in the Burning Crusade cinematic quite a few years ago. And um, here you can see it in the shot. Uh, this was one with Illidan. He was holding this skull and throwing it down. And I remember this was a really fun one to work on. And I was so excited when I was creating it. You can see it here on this ballista up in the corner where we recycled it for a Warlords of Drainer cinematic. But I remember meticulously trying to make sure every side matched and all that. Once I showed some people, they're like, oh, cool. Thank God you had symmetry. And I was like, what's symmetry? So back then, I didn't even know what the symmetry tool was. So I remember trying to do everything by hand asymmetrically. But you learn. Um, this is the dark portal. It's also from that cinematic. So this is another one that I worked on. And the thing that I really remember clearly on this is we sculpted this thing at a massive world scale value. And it was so big that um, 
ZBrush, something with the coordinate system was having a hard time extracting displacement maps. And I can still remember I was emailing Jaime back and forth and sending these models. So one of the guys that runs the entire company was like jamming with me, probably Paul as well, and helped me get the displacement maps and send it back. And the reason I bring that up is relationship, whether I'm working on my personal stuff or professionally, has continued to be that good with these guys. They're awesome. So um, they're always helping out, and it feels like a family. really dig it. This is some stuff from uh, StarCraft II that I created, and this is a, a little bit of a better example of how I'll show you guys how you can actually take photographs that you'll create, combine them with the displacement to get a highly realistic render like you see here. This is just kind of this canyon ground that I took some photos of and then combine it with some ZBrush techniques to get what you see. Uh, this next one, uh, we've never shown this before. This was something that uh, you'll see in a few why you haven't seen this. But this was from a shot in, uh, spoiler alert, where Kerrigan, which is one of our zergified humans, uh, was basically de-zergified. So she was found in the cinematics within this one location where the ground was all this nice zerg hive type stuff that had to feel like it was somewhat destroyed. So I had to kind of concept this, come up with an idea of what I thought would be an interesting composition, but also something I could sculpt organically. So what you see at the bottom, uh, this is a low poly mesh I did. A lot of times I work a lot of my forms in to really make sure I know where I want to flow the eye. Uh, this is kind of the standard textured version of it. It's a little bit dark on the screen, but um, I remember the funny thing about this was I was working on this off and on for about a month, and I just had all these super disgusting pictures on my secondary monitor of like guts and dead bodies, and people would be bringing their families by to check out stuff and quickly walk past my computer. <laughs> But you get desensitized to it once you've been working on it a while. Uh, so here's Kerrigan, all naked looking on top of this nasty environment. And as those of you that work in production might know, sometimes the work you see in the final frame doesn't get seen. So here's the final frames. <laughs> so um, the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, for those of you that aren't in the industry professionally yet, or those that do work professionally, don't get too personally attached to your stuff because you never know whenever something might end up like this. And I think you can see a couple spec highlights up here somewhere <laughs> of my stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, I, I can't remember exactly why we had to do that. I think it was a ratings issue. It was going to raise the, the rating to like mature level for the game, just the one shot showing too much skin. So uh, I had to cover up my stuff. But for me, it was still a fun experience. I got to learn a lot, and that's all that mattered to me. Now this, this is more like what I do these days as a supervisor. So this is my calendar at work. I have a lot of meetings. Our, our department's pretty big, constantly doing stuff. So that's why I, I like doing ZBrush at home all the time. Constantly look at a lot of stuff like this. I think these are bid sheets for our Bastion show. And then as a supervisor too, it's really important for me to have high morale for the team and lead by example, as you can see here, uh, <laughs> with our artist Laurent Perlot. I'm reviewing his work, and you know, it's looking okay, but I gotta make sure he doesn't know he's doing too good, so that they keep working hard. And I think he was in our live sculpt off yesterday. He hopefully wasn't crying like that when we were doing that. <laughs> uh, okay, so now it's our little history lesson for Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos. So that image you saw earlier, the reason I wanna show you this one is now I'll kinda go into detail about how this stuff was created. So as I mentioned at the top, Patrick Thomas, this guy was a mentor of mine. Um, and this top right image, uh, this was a photograph that our director Nick Carpenter took when he went on a trip in the Grand Canyon. And he just loved these forms and he wanted us to use this throughout the cinematic. And then you can see the displacement map that uh, Patrick created literally just from taking that photo up here and then kind of messing with the black and white values. And it's used everywhere in that shot. And it holds up pretty well even today, I think. And this is from, I think we created this back in 2002. So it still holds up. Um, this is one that I worked on a lot. This was a, a lot of fun. And the first part that I want to show you about, this is from a cinematic called The Death of Hellscream. And it was kind of in this crater, lava-like environment. Imagine like a volcano, but it's all green. And uh, the first thing I want to kind of let you guys know as an environment artist, think outside the box. Like there's certain patterns that you see in nature all the time, whether it's lightning streaks. In, in lightning, you might see that in a leaf, like the veins of something, or even in organically. So a lot of times you can get interesting results out of something like this. And this is a star galaxy map. But if you take something like that and you invert it, it looks kind of like an interesting displacement map, right? And in fact, that's how we displace the ground in here. 
So if you look up here, you can see where the characters are standing. You can actually, if you look and compare, you can see where we took this displacement map of an inverted star galaxy, placed it on the ground, gets a very realistic looking lava result. The reason I bring that up is um, a lot of people think like, I need to get a picture of bark in order to get tree bark to look perfect. It can help if you have a scanner, but a lot of times you can even just find something interesting in nature and find a way to make it look cool. Now this next part, this gets more into um, how we actually took photographs and then did modeling where we had the photographs that were originally created, generated displacement maps out of them, and then also uh, placed them with texture maps, everything else to get a highly realistic result. And these are old turntables I somehow found from like 15 years ago that I created when I was making all this stuff. And these are all the original assets that we took, modular pieces to put into all these shots. So uh, the reason I'm showing you this is I remember we had a really overcast day, not like this sunny picture day, but uh, me and Patrick, we went down to Crystal Cove State Beach, beautiful beach, it's about an hour south of here. Has amazing rock formations everywhere. And we took tons of photos. We just took hundreds and hundreds of photos. And we did this to get great reference, but also to find stuff that we could have for making displacement maps out of. So a lot of interesting forms that you can see here. That was a really good inspiration for us to kind of figure out the design language that we wanted to make for that interesting cratered environment. And what you see here on the left, uh, this is a slightly altered uh, photo that we took. And then you can kind of see those shapes represented at the top up there. If you look, it looks sort of like that map. And then down low, I actually almost one-to-one -one created that shape. And then as we put those in the environment, they start to work out pretty well. So here's like that original map that's almost like the photo we took, and then removing lighting information. I think this was actually our displacement map. Here's another example. Um, this is at the end of the cinematic. You can kind of see the ground that's underneath uh, Hell Scream here. And this, again, was all based off photos. So this is a nice photo we took up here on the top right. We made a bump and displacement map out of this. Pair them together, and it still, honestly, I think you could put this into a movie today. It would hold up just fine. And back then, when we were displacing stuff, it was all done in 3D Studio Max at the time with a displacement modifier placed on top that would you throw in your black and white map in order to displace it. And I'll show you how to do that in ZBrush. So, about a month ago, when I was trying to figure out what I want to show you guys, I was trying to see if all those um, techniques still held up. And what I did is I really quickly created what you see here from one of those original photos that I took down in Crystal Cove. So this is a um, photo from like 12 years ago or 15, whenever I took this. I made a displacement map out of it. And um, I think it still holds up pretty realistically. And the one thing that I want to point out with displacement is whenever I create these displacement maps that I'll show you guys later, it's really important to kind of blur out your surfaces because you don't want it being super crisp when you do your massive displacement. And then I usually do a secondary displacement with a crisp bump map. And to kind of get an idea of how we used to do displacement and still how displacement is calculated in a lot of programs today, a lot of times it's based off of a 255 RGB grayscale values. And as you can see here, this is a displacement map up top. I literally took that map, took it onto a plane, displaced this in ZBrush. That's what you're seeing below, just as an example. The white values at 255 being the ones that will um, displace the highest value that you can have. And then ones at zero is going to displace at the negative value. 128 is a neutral value, which means no displacement. You can kind of see that represented there. So not super pretty, but this was a good test case for me uh, where I was like, yeah, I think this can still hold up. And then the other thing you see in here is I just threw some snow. And then, of course, since I was in Keyshot and you could find ice shaders, I'm like, I'm going to make some ice cubes. But uh, that was just for fun. And uh, here's another example of a, a trick that I'll be showing you in the live demo. And this is from uh, one of our cinematic expansions, the Frozen Throne for Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos. And uh, this is the last shot of the sequence. And pretty much everything you see in here is um, simple models that we then displace with those 2D black and white painted maps that you see. And again, this was mostly done by my mentor at the time, Patrick Thomas, and this was another trick that he taught me where, and here it looks, on my monitor over here it's green, but down there in the darker values, you have kind of like the glacier of the uh, ice crown here, and then the white parts are actually just the exact same mesh that we duplicated and then using FFDs and different things, you just push it out a little bit, 
and then you add a snow shader on top. It's just an old school, simple technique, take an original model you got, copy it, move it up just a little bit, push some things in and out, and then you can have snow on top of it, you can have dirt, all sorts of stuff. And then uh, that leads into where I was like, all right, what can I fit into like a 30 minute demo to show you guys a lot of techniques and hopefully create something that's not overwhelming but still should be cool. And this is what I came up with, um, this kind of snow covered well. So that being said, we're going to jump right into our live demo. And you guys probably won't see my face when I'm doing this now, but I'll be back here. By the way, I'm a little stuffed up today, so um, if you guys are shaking my hand after, just beware that you might catch a cold that I've got. All right. So before I jump into here, I want to show you a couple things. Um, I've got a couple different maps that I created for this demo. And this is a tileable displacement map that I created out of a, a stone wall photo that I found online. And then here's a tileable displacement map that I made out of this. I don't have time to demo how I created all these. However, for those who are watching online and then for you here in the audience, you'll still be here. But I'm going to show you I have a online tutorial that's going to be launching at 11 today after my demo, and you guys will be able to download everything step by step. So even here, as I go through this demo, if you want to take notes, you can, but I have some really detailed stuff that's coming later where you can follow step by step online, and uh, you can just sit back and enjoy. Uh, this is a spec map, and then let's go back. This is a bump map I created, and in those tutorials, I describe all the details of what, why I've done the things that you see here. Um, this is a moss map that we're going to use later for something creative. And this tutorial that I'll be releasing online is going to include all this stuff for you as well. All right. So in ZBrush, since we're making a well, obviously we want to start with something that's like a, a primitive object. So what I've got here is a cylinder. And as you guys see, I'm just going to be using the standard UI. I like to do this because I do a lot of tutorials and show people stuff, so it's just easy for them to jump right in. And the first thing that we're going to do here is just make this poly mesh 3D. Give it a couple subdivisions by pressing Control D, Control D, Shift F. I just want to see what this looks like. I'm going to Shift F again. You can see the topology here is a little funky. Um, I want to have evenly distributed topology, so that's where the DynaMesh tool always comes in really nicely. And I know a lot of you here know all these chips, tips and tricks. You've been doing this forever, but I'll pretend like a lot of you don't know as well, so I'll just go through all the steps. So I'm going to say uh, no here. And now we get the nice evenly distributed topology. That's really important when you're displacing because you want to make sure that you get the same amount of resolution everywhere you go. So now since we're going to make a well, we of course want to cut a hole in the center of this. So here's a pretty cool feature we can do. We're going to make a Boolean cutter mesh to cut a hole. So let's duplicate this mesh. And down here, this is going to be the one that we're going to end up cutting a hole out of. So I'm going to press W to go to my move mode up here for my transpose tool. I'm just going to click this. Each of these axes, right now, it's currently in the center of my object, which is convenient. So I'm going to do this. And I'm going to non-uniform scale this by um, clicking on this red piece here. And you can see here, it's kind of going crazy. But just hold down the Shift key, and that'll lock it to an uh, orthographic axis. I'm going to go to my uh, top view. I'm going to uniformly scale this down a bit by pressing uh, E to get to my scale mode. And then right here, I'll just kind of drag that down a bit. I'm going to press Shift F. That's kind of bothering me looking at that. I think that's about right. And this will give us kind of a, like a nice top, and this will be a good hole for where we can cut the hole out of the, uh, the well. So over here, we want to make sure that our bottom uh, object is a cutter mesh. So this icon here that looks like two circles combining in the center, click that. And then you come down here to poly groups. We're going to say group is DynaMesh sub. And then what we're going to do now, come up here to your top mesh. Let's just merge that down. OK. And then we're going to hold down the Control key and drag right here. Voila, we got a hole in here. So very useful tool. I love using that. Uh, let's press B now, and we'll go to our standard mode. I want to smooth this out a little bit on the edge. So I'm going to hit X to go to symmetry, so we can just do this a little faster. Hold down the Shift key. All of you guys probably know this, but we can smooth that out on the side here. Other thing I want to do really quick, because we're going to take this in the key shot after, is I want to make sure that we actually have this facing correctly. So I'm showing my floor here. 
And I'm the type of person that I don't like to waste apology, so I'm going to mask out the bottom of this and then delete it. So I'm going to control drag here, make a mask on it, control W so that I can make a poly group. And if you press shift F, you can see the frames again. You notice the different color variations here. Uh, now we have different poly groups. So let's uh, control shift click this, and then click it again. And now we have everything um, except for that bottom part, which I want to delete out. So I'm going to delete that in just a second. Before I do that, though, I'm going to turn off this Dynamesh. And now let's go to Modify Topology, Delete Hidden. And now we won't have any topology down at the bottom, which is exactly what I want. Now we do have two different polygroups in here still, so I'm going to go ahead and mask this entire thing because I want it to be all one polygroup. Control W again, so now we have it all as one group. So let's give this some UVW maps. And the reason we want to put UVWs on this is we're going to be doing our displacement the old school way that I used to, and we have to have UV maps in order to do that. So you remember that nice, big, tiling uh, stone wall that we created? That's how we're going to create our stones for this. So we're going to use the super nifty Z plugin UV master tool. And um, we're just going to turn each of these off. Let's just say unwrap. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's hit flatten. We can take a look at how those UVs look. That's honestly just about as perfect as I could go. But because we're in here and a lot of people don't know that you can do this, I just want to show you really quick. Uh, if you go to your transpose tool, you drag that out, you can move your UVs around. And you can rotate them if you need to. And this comes in really convenient whenever you want to displace things based off of a map. Just imagine you had like a a directional map that's going up and down like this and needs to flow with the direction of UV, you can just adjust that quickly within here and then you'll be able to displace that way. So I'm going to non-uniform scale this a little bit. I mean, this is relaxed perfectly, uh, but for this demo, um, I know that I need to non-uniform scale this, so you just have to trust me on this. I'm going to unflatten this, so now we're back into our uh, original tool. And before we can displace this, we need to add a texture map on top. One sec. Here we go. Let's throw on this Stonewall Diffuse pattern. I'm going to press Shift F to hide this. I think this will be pretty good. It looks pretty nice. So we'll use that. And then um, now that we have a texture map on this, we can actually displace it. So let's click this. Import. Let's find that displacement pattern we had. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry, guys. Thank you. It, yeah, let me know, because I'm not looking up there. If, you, if there's something that looks funky, just let me know. Um, let's... All right. A little better? All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, just yell out if uh, something gets funky up there. Sorry about that. All right, let's do that. Um, yep, yep, yep. Here we go. Voila. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Done. All right. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay, sweet. So now uh, we have, uh, well, obviously we have our texture map on, so you can see going on there. And um, now with our displacement map, we can actually come in and then uh, apply displacement. But first, what we need to do is make sure there's some intensity. So I'm just going to add this to like maybe a 0.15. I don't want it too strong. And I'm going to apply displacement. And you can see here it's actually displacing the surfaces out a little bit. Uh, the problem is, is if I turn off this texture map, it's like really low resolution. So let's go ahead and undo that. Let's give this some more subdivisions. It's only about 76,000 right now. Control D, Control D. We'll get up into the million range. And let's uh, displace that again. Oh, and before I do this, one thing I want to show you guys. You see this mid value? At default, it's set to 0 0.5. Remember that image I showed you previously with the, the 255, 128, and 0? If I understand this correctly, the 0.5 is kind of like the equivalent of a neutral value of 128. So if you're doing a displacement based off a grayscale map, think of that 128 gray value as your point mid, 0.5 mid value, and then it will place in and out from that with your white or black values. So let's do that again. Let's create displacement. Oops, that is not what I wanted. I meant to apply displacement. And uh, I'm going to go just a little bit stronger on this. 
Let's give it like a point two. Okay, cool. So already, I mean, if, if this was in a video game, you could probably use this and it would work out just fine. But uh, we need to make this look a little bit cooler. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off this texture map and let's uh, zoom in here a bit. And you can see we get a little bit of distortion here. I'm not too worried about that. I'm going to give it just like one more level of displacement, but I'm going to use that bump map that we had previously. Stonewall pattern bump. And let's give this a really low intensity of maybe 0.05. And then we just get a little bit more interesting textural information in there. So one thing that um, we may want to go through and fix, as you can see up here, we get some weird kind of areas where the UVs have pushed out a little bit too far on the edges of this. So let's go ahead and switch to our brush palette. And I'm going to press T because I want to use the trim dynamic. I like using this brush a lot. And we can just go through here and uh, smooth out some of these areas. And honestly, I think maybe I did the, the bump a little bit too strong, the noise value. But from a distance, it'll probably hold up just fine. And this actually is not bothering me too much because what we're going to do in the end, we're going to use that snow technique in order to put snow right on top of this. Over here, you can see this is where our UV seam was, so maybe you want to clean that up a bit. Use a combo of maybe the uh, smooth tool with this. Yep, and I think in my uh, online tutorial, I go through and I spend a lot more time cleaning all this stuff up, but I do want to have some time for Q&A at the end of this, so I'm just going to breeze through this. You get the basic idea. So what we want to do now is we need to, first thing I'm going to do actually is, let's turn that texture map back on so you can see that. And we're going to make a duplicate of this subtool. Ooh, not that. I just deleted it. All right, so that's not what we wanted to do. Now it's gone forever. But luckily I have an old thing I can pull up. I've, I've demoed this like 15 times. It's the first time I've done that. <laughs> oh, brilliant. So this one's gonna look a little bit different, but whatever. Um, You don't have an undo button for delete, do you? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Warnings. Okay. So you're going to get a sneak peek of what it's going to kind of look like at the end here, but let's, let's delete these because we don't want those. So let's pretend we're back where we were a minute ago. Yay. Yay. All right. That was scary. Okay, so uh, let's duplicate this again, and let's not delete it this time. And um, oh, one thing I want to show you guys really quick is we want to bake this material down onto here. So let's come up here, and we want to hit M for material channel, and then say color and fill object. So now this should be applied to here. And now let's go down to our bottom one. And one that I like to use that feels like snow is uh, Sketch Shaded 3. So that's already kind of on it. So let's go down here. I'm going to turn off the texture map. Actually, I'm going to pick a different map, just a default, something that looks like snow. So obviously, this is just sitting right on top. We need to kind of move this up a bit. So let's go to our transpose tool. And we'll just move this up slightly. And again, like as I'm moving this, if you hold down the shift key, you can then lock it, which is what I like to do. So there you go. You got snow on rocks. So. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it, it's still a little bit uh, CG looking, so we'll fill in a little bit of space up here up top. So press B, we'll go to clay build up. This one's pretty nice to come in here. And, you know, the top of this, if you're looking at reference, it's probably going to feel like it's covered with snow. And also, too, we want to make this feel less CG like. And that's where we can have a bit more fun here. Paul, I can take a question right now if someone wants to ask anything. All right, otherwise, I'll just... Oh, there's one now. 
Oh, now, now Joe Meno pulls up now. Hold on. When you were creating your base maps, did you use Crazy Bump or uh, Endo or any of those pieces of software that are available for that type of texture map to displacement map process? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good point. I, I wish uh, I would have had some of those programs back in the day. And in fact, I don't know why I didn't think about using that when I was creating this demo. So um, we could probably end up taking that displacement map that I was showing you earlier in that folder, throwing it into one of those programs and getting some, uh, actually a pretty good base for that. So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, for those of you, if you don't have the program Crazy Bump, it's extremely affordable. It's, I think it's, well, at least when I bought it, it was only like 100 bucks or something. And that tool is amazing. So if you don't have it, write that down, check it out. You can drop almost any map in there, and you can get some really interesting displacement maps, bump maps, allows you to remove light from things really quickly. I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, yeah. Did it? Yeah, I did it because I, I was so into the mindset of doing it the old school way, the painful way, that um, <laughs> yeah, I did everything in Photoshop and hand painted it. So that's the way with passion. That's right. <laughs> Passionately did it. The type of passion that drove me crazy enough that I was usually drinking some alcohol every time I was doing it. <laughs> yes. Cool. All right. So now we got this uh, looking kind of nice up here. And sorry, I won't be able to take any more questions for a few minutes. Uh, next thing we want to do is um, let's add like kind of a nice little drifted snow plane. Paul, how are we doing on time? Excellent. So let's go back here to our cylinder. Let's make sure we don't delete anything this time. And uh, come up here to plane 3D. And we have this. This is going to become our snow plane. And I'm going to append this. Append. And this will just allow us to add that to here. So now you see it appear in here. We just don't see it because it's that. Um, one angle that we're able to view. So let's click on this to make it active. We can see it down here. I'm going to press W again on my keyboard to go to Transpose Tool. I'm going to drag this out. And I want to rotate this down so that we can uh, make it feel like a ground plane. I'm going to snap to my orthographic view here, Shift and click. And we can't see it, but I know that I'll be able to have the control over this with the rotation I need. So I'm going to just uh, drag this way. And if you were to look, you can see it's rotated somewhat. Let's undo that. And this time when we rotate, I'm going to hold down the shift key, and that'll snap it to like certain values. And I'm going to come right here, which I know is about 90. I'm going to let go. And now I know that it, we have this set up nicely where we need to go. Oops. Let's go back to our transpose tool one more time. Click this little anchor. Let's uh, move this over here. Now we get kind of centered, but this thing is way too small. So we need to increase the size on this. I'm going to do that with the scale. It's going to uniformly scale this up a few times. All right. Yeah, if any of you guys have watched me demo before, the way I like to demo is where I can show you how quick it is to do something in ZBrush, even if it's, you know, not the Terminator Cyborg or something super awesome like that. But my, my thing, whenever I watch tutorials and the way I like to learn is, unfortunately, I don't have time to usually watch seven or eight hour tutorials. So I like to do things that are quick, pick up a few tips and tricks like we were seeing in all the demos that are here, and you just quickly level up by seeing all that stuff. In fact, I had some stuff I was doing for a while called ZBrush Quick Tips that the goal was to try and do in 15 seconds, teach people something. Um, so anyways, uh, let's go ahead and build up some snow around this. I'm going to press Shift F because I want to see the topology on this. And I'm going to uh, Control D, give it a little bit more subdivision. But before I go super high poly on this, I want to keep it low so that I can affect the uh, base mesh over a, a, a wider area without having to go into super tiny detail. A lot of times people want to jump in right away and start adding tons of detail to a high poly mesh, but what you'll find out in production and from people who've been doing this a long time is 
they tend to do a lot of their large form changes on stuff at a very uh, low poly level, and then they start adding in the detail once they lock the silhouette and the most important things. I'm going to change this uh, dot here to like a spray. Let's see what that does. That's kind of cool. It's a little bit too strong, so let's turn down our Z intensity to something like 10. And let's uh, build up some snow around one side here. Let's imagine that, you know, we got a, a, a snowstorm that's in a cold place like where Joe Mena lives, and he's indoors just sculpting toys all day long while I'm out here surfing in California. So, you know, the snow is drifting up here on the side of this thing. Joe, where do you live? Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, I'm sure it gets cold up there. Yeah, Jersey's got some good surf. If people will follow my Instagram, I, uh, I do a lot of surfing, so I have surfing and art. That's like my thing. All right, so this doesn't look perfect, but over here we'll imagine that maybe the wind was blowing and pushing this in a bit, and then over here on this side the wind's not blowing quite as much. And as you guys probably know, you hold down the Alt key and you can uh, reverse what the um, brush is doing. Now, one thing that I like to do a lot is, this is kind of cool, like whenever you're building stuff up around here, <laughs> when you're really close to something with a, another subtool showing, it kind of sees that, so it, it won't allow you to do too much stuff where it builds up strong around the sides here. Uh, but if you turn on transparency, um, it allows you to see the object underneath, but then you can start moving things regardless of what the shape is underneath. So this allows us to get a better transition from where that snow is going to meet. All right. Let's quickly just block out some of the other forms here. Um, I can probably take another question real quick if anyone has anything. And if not, I can just tell you stories. Tell me stories. All right. So today, uh, like last night, I was literally in a coughing fit as I was practicing. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this today. So I researched some stuff, found that you can get hot tea with lemon and honey, and that helps out. I'm going to drink some of that right now. Then I got really sick. I was out of work most of the week. Um, last year in uh, Norway, I was giving a presentation, and we gave like seven or eight presentations, each around two hours each. And I'm sure some of my buddies over there are watching right now, and it was a really awesome experience. But I remember the second day, halfway into one of my presentations, I got hit by like the Viking plague. And literally, I just started sweating bullets. I had fever, I had to pull a trash can close to me. And I just told the crowd, I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna get through this. But um, somehow I made it and then uh, just went home and slept that off for about 20 hours. But luckily, I'm not that way today. It's a good challenge, though. Uh, all right, we're going to mask this out. Control W, uh, Shift F. And I, again, I want to delete some of this topology because I, I don't want to see this stuff around the edge where it's kind of pillowing up like this. So I'm going to Control Shift click this center one. And what I'm going to do now is go to our geometry. Delete lower subdivisions, and then delete hidden. OK. Let's turn off our transparency. We're going to add some more detail to the snow plane that we have below in just a second. Before we do that, though, I want to try and um, take our top snow piece here and blend it in a bit. Whoa. I think something is just active here. All right. So I'm going to come back to the uh, clay buildup brush. And we're just going to come in here and start building some of that out. I'm going to turn off the uh, lazy mouse, which is on by default. And we'll just kind of pull this out so it blends in a little bit nicer around the edge, because you probably wouldn't have um, a lot of rock showing where the uh, base of the snow would be in something like this. Paul, how much time I got left? OK. So one thing I love about doing these kind of demos, um, and especially working with the Pixelogic guys, is they have so many fun tools to play with, like Keyshot and everything else. 
And I've had Keyshot for a while, but I never really took the time to learn how to do materials in it and really learn how to play around with the HDRI maps and all the powerful tools that are in there. And because I was doing this demo and I really wanted to use that uh, in this tutorial, or I guess this live demo, it allowed me to take some time to force myself to learn that. And that's what I always find on these demos. Like, even as I'm doing this, I, I learn new things as I go through. And uh, I recommend for people, if you haven't done it before and you have the opportunity, doing things like this is really, really fun to do. And it forces you to learn new things and meet a lot of really cool people, too. All right, so maybe this side, the sun's been hitting this because it's like the California side. And, you know, the snow's melted. And then we got the, the cold New Jersey side over here. So that's where there's more snow that's blown and built up on here. Um, and, you know, whenever you look at reference photos, that's what I do all the time as an environment artist, just constantly look at reference. And you'll see even like snow is kind of chewed up like this around the edges. You know, up here it probably wouldn't look like this. That's where I'd go through with maybe the uh, shift key to smooth some of that out. But in the end, and uh, Keyshot will add a material on top that'll kind of get rid of some of those CG forms. But reference, 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 everything. No matter what I start, anytime I'm doing anything. Like when I, before I did this, I was just searching for snow wells, like wells covered with snow, anything. Anything you can find uh, is extremely helpful because you'll just see little things that happen in nature that um, are just there that really make a difference and can kind of break away that CG feel of things. Okay. So, you know, if I had more time, I, I'd go through and really blend this nicely through here. But for the sake of this demo and getting through it, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. One thing I do want to do, though, is give this a little bit more textual information. So I'm going to go into our alpha brush, or not alpha brush, but our alpha panel here. And I'm going to import this uh, Moss A tileable bump. And this is just an old Moss map that I was using back on an old personal project I did. And uh, this is one of those things where think outside the box and you can get some interesting results. So this plane, it has the UVs on it by default. So what I want to do is I know that this is not going to be a high enough um, tiling for my masking. What I'll show you is come here, mask by alpha. I use this all the time. You can see the uh, alpha that we popped in here is you can now mask here. So if we started painting, it respects that. Uh, but I want to up the frequency of that. So one thing you can do, which is super useful, is just change your H and V tiling. I'll pump this up to like 3 and 3. And uh, let's mask that again. And now we get a little bit higher frequency detail. So if we wanted, we could come through with the brush and do it like this, and you get some interesting information. But just in the sake of a demo, I want to show you another tool that I love to use, which is uh, the inflate tool. So. On this, let's give it like a value of maybe 15. Cool. So that starts to get something really quickly. Instead of taking your brush around that, imagine this thing was gigantic. You don't have to take the time to do that by hand. You can just come in here and do it there. Um, I'm going to press Alt and then click off the side here to, oops, uh, let's reverse our mask. Control click, sorry. Control clicking over here, that'll invert our mask. And let's do a negative inflate this time of like maybe negative 20 or Whatever I just typed in there. And let's clear our mask. So now we got some information. Probably what I should have done is subdivided this more beforehand, but I forgot to do that. Not a big deal. And then if you want to break up some of the CG feel, maybe just come through here and hold down the shift key as you're doing this to break up some of that weathering. Now I think our snow that we have up here already has like a little bit of information that's going to hold up OK. If I had more time, I would make sure that the tiling and the detail between something like this and this was in uh, unison. But uh, I think this will be good enough for now. So let's go ahead and uh, apply some materials to this and learn a little bit about Keyshot. Before we do that, I'm going to make sure that each of these has a material applied to it. Because in Keyshot, I'm going to be adjusting some materials. And I want to make sure that we keep our UV coordinates that we put on this into uh, Keyshot. So this one really quick, I'm just going to add a default uh, shader on it. And I believe each of these, yep, cool. So let's uh, kick this on over to Keyshot. 
And already, I've already set this up earlier, but normally if you want to send it over, you just come down here to external render, click on Keyshot to enable that. Once you do that, you can hit the BPR button and send that on over to Keyshot. All right, here we go. So this is, uh, for those of you familiar with Keyshot, um, and for you not familiar, this is just the default lighting setup that pops in here. But we want to obviously find something that feels more wintry and cold and snow-like. And uh, one thing I want to show you guys, if you don't already know about it, is if you click on this button, it takes you to the uh, cloud library. And uh, I think I'm already logged in here. Um, but all you guys have to do is you can create a username. I, I can't remember if you have to have a license to Keyshot or not. I do at home. But you can come in here. You can make materials, environment maps, anything you want. It's an amazing resource. It has tons of stuff. And uh, what I wanted to get was a nice uh, snow-based HDRI map. So I just typed this, and then I went here to environments. And I found this really cool one that someone took called Outdoor Mammoth. And it's, uh, I guess, from up at Mammoth Mountain. And um, I downloaded that. And once you download that, you can come in here into the uh, environment section. You can see that it's in here. So I'm just going to double click that to put that in our scene. So now we start to get the lighting information from that nice map that was taken. So now it's all about finding a, a good background. And also, too, remember we made that um, nice kind of sloping where the snow drift comes up. So we want to make sure that we're just having our camera face this one section right here. And I think this is pretty good right here, but I want to adjust the environment map a little bit, or the HDRI, so let's come over here, click this, and then uh, we can change the settings here. Uh, you can like rotate this if you wanted to. And the reason that's useful is if the lighting that we liked that was based on this side of the HDRI map uh, was on the other side, you would need to rotate this, because if you want to rotate your object, you're never going to line it up properly. And then we can adjust the height because I want to have a nice silhouette uh, breaking up where the well is actually sitting. So now it feels maybe like we're on a hilltop or something like that. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some materials to this. By default, because we brought this in, we already have some ZBrush materials that have been applied to our object. But I like to cheat and get some of the surface values that are already custom within Keyshot from some of the stuff we have. So underneath material here, I'm going to come to stone. And I think brick will be a good one. Let's drag that over here. You can just drag and drop. That applies your material to your object. Obviously, we don't want brick on here. So let's uh, come down. Let's modify this. We're going to click on here, the textures. And this we're just going to replace with those um, maps that we use to displace our surface. So stone wall pattern diffuse. We'll drop that in. Um, what you're going to notice at first is that um, it's not actually laying on there properly. That's because right now the mapping type is set to box map. So just click on this and set it to UV coordinates. And now this will use the UV coordinates that we had with uh, ZBrush, but we need to turn this off, the DPI, at least for this material I used. So now it starts to set in here, and um, you can see that everything is lining up properly. What I'm going to do really quick just to show you guys. So here's the, the rock material that we've got in here. takes a little time to refresh, but uh, it's already looking pretty good. So let's adjust a little bit more. We'll make sure we don't have that specular weirdness in here from the brick map. So we've got all these maps that are going to be available in the tutorial that I'll give you online. And you'll see that the maps get funky again. Each time you add something in here, you just need to re-click this and set it back to UV coordinates. Let's give it a stonewall pattern bump as well. You know what? That's really dark. Let's brighten that up so you guys can see this. And that's a cool thing you can do, too. So we'll come down here to Fuse, and let's just crank this up so you guys can see it. That's a little better. Cool. And the thing that's great about this is since we're using a photo that we took, you know, everything is lining up perfectly. All our texture maps are going to line up perfectly. Everything's just running in unison, which is the beauty of using these techniques that a lot of people don't use anymore. 
Um, and the thing that I really like about this too is it, it kind of uses the same methodology if you think about a, a program or like mega scans or the scanning companies that scan in all the data, they give you all the displacement information. That stuff is amazing, it really is, but you know, if you want to take a photo in your backyard of something, which I do all the time, this is a way you can do it yourself, or if you're a student, you don't have a lot of money, um, and you can't find pirated stuff, <laughs> then uh, you can just go out and make your own things. So let's go ahead and adjust our snow now. And already, the, the standard material that came in from ZBrush, that um, sketch shaded thing, it honestly looks pretty good, but just for the sake of uh, showing you another cool material that you can find online, I found one that I really liked from that Keyshot Cloud Library, and it was, uh, let's type in Glacial, I just remember the name of this. There's a material in here called M76 Glacial that someone created, so I downloaded that, and that one ended up being really good for snow. So let's come up here, I think I should have this in my... Uh, <laughs> Oh, okay, here we go. I named mine Snow, but the name, if you pulled it in, would be M76 Glacial. And then we can just drag that onto our surface, and I, already you can kind of tell this just reacts a little bit more properly, the lighting properties, it kind of feels nice compared to the, the background here of the snow in this. And you could drag this again over to this other snow one, but we don't want to have to adjust the materials, the properties of two different materials, so since this one's live and attached to the plane, let's take that and we'll just drag it onto our other snow surface. So now we can adjust the uh, settings of both of these and um, it'll affect both of the planes. And honestly, we could stop here if we wanted to, but I'll just show you one more thing with that snow material. This one, they have an interesting, the author that created this, an interesting diffuse setup. We're not going to mess with that. But we're going to come in here into the uh, bump setting and let's go back in and remember that Moss A tileable bump. Let's throw that in here. And once you see this refresh, you can start to see that this is actually applied. But right now, uh, you see the scale, the X and Y. In any of your 3D programs or even in uh, ZBrush, this is like your tiling. So think of it that way. So if you set this to 1 and 1, it's just going to be the uh, default values of the map. And then we could change this to UV coordinates since we have UV coordinates for both of these. And then you can see you start to get some uh, different kind of textural information on this. Frequency is a little bit too high, so I'm going to actually increase the tiling. The thing that's interesting with uh, Keyshot, unless I'm totally doing this wrong, is that instead of doing like 2 and 2, which you would think would uh, double that, you actually want to say 0.5 and 0.5. And that's the one that actually increases the, the tiling of this if you're doing it based off of uh, UV coordinate. So then you start to get more information in here. All right, let's go ahead and just wrap this up because uh, we give you guys a, a couple minutes for questions. Um, this is most of it. If I had more time, you'd obviously get something that looks a lot prettier, especially once we take it into Photoshop and some other programs and uh, comp it together. But the main thing I wanted to show you guys is how quickly using some of the, the old techniques that we did back in the day with maps, um, how you can at home, even today, like I, I take photos everywhere. Uh, you know, take a photo of something on a sidewalk, a crack or things like that, and go home, paint those things out. You can get a really cool looking result. And then also I hope, even though this is pretty elementary stuff, that um, there hopefully were some nuggets within the presentation, some tips maybe you didn't know about, things like that that you learned from. And that's kind of like how I, I like to teach. The final thing I want to show you guys, and if I set up everything properly, um, let's take a look here. For those of you guys that uh, follow me on Facebook, uh, if you don't, just check for Seth Thompson Art or Art of Seth Thompson. I created a Gumroad tutorial which just went live. So if you want to get this stuff, you just come in here, you can find the link. It's all free. Um, it's got 90 minutes of videos that'll take you step by step through every single part of the stuff I showed in here, much more in depth. And then as well as it, it also shows you all the uh, way I created this placement maps in Photoshop, all those things. And it includes those maps I create as well. So um, hopefully that'll be something cool you guys can check out. And that's all I got for you today. So thank you guys so much for coming out.